So uh, I'm going to begin just by talking a little bit about a term, which is incarnation, incarnatio in Latin. Uh, that word is actually coming from the prologue of St. John's Gospel, the fourth gospel in the New Testament, where uh, it says the word became flesh. And the translation in uh, Latin is incarnatio, uh, became, took on human flesh. But that being said, when you talk about the incarnation in traditional Christian theology, we don't just mean the idea that the eternal word, the eternal son of God became human, that God became, uh, that, sorry, that God took on a human body, but that he took on a full human nature. Right? So God became human, not just took on human flesh. The incarnation doesn't just mean that God became one with a body, but God became a human being with a body and soul. So that's what the term means, God became human, at least as it's used traditionally, building out of that original New Testament language. And I'm gonna look at tonight a famous question uh, that Aquinas asks that all medieval theologians asked, and that is also still frequently posed in modern theology. What are the motives of the incarnation? What was God thinking of? What was he doing? What's at work in his wisdom or his intentions in becoming human? And Aquinas writes about this in the famous Summa Theologiae, his last masterwork of theology and his most famous work, in the beginning of the third part of the Summa. That is to say, the last part of the Summa, uh, in which the entire uh, section is about Christ, the mysteries of the life of Jesus. And that entire section begins with this question about the motives of the Incarnation. So when Aquinas begins studying the mystery of Jesus Christ in general, he begins with this specific question first. What are the motives of the incarnation? Why did God become human? And the, the reason is obvious. I mean, he's looking at the divine, you might say, intentions or the design of God. What was the logic of God becoming human? And that, that answer to the question will, in a certain way, help frame the, the entire study of the life of Jesus, the, the childhood and nativity of Jesus, the mm, uh, apostolic ministry of Christ, his miracles, his teaching, his way of life, his suffering his passion, his resurrection. So Aquinas has a series of questions in the first, uh, well, he calls them questio, questiones, the first is body of questions, really, what we call in English a question is a series, is what he, he calls the, what he uses for the word in Latin, a question is actually a series of articles, and each article contains what we call a question, All right? So he has a series of, I think, six questions or so interior to this first part of the Summa. And in the uh, second article, which is where I'm going to begin, he asks the question, was the incarnation necessary for human salvation? And I'm going to spend a lot of time on this first article. Now, the first thing I want to say is just something about theology in general. When Aquinas is asking um, whether the incarnation was necessary for our salvation, you might think he's trying to prove that God had to become incarnate to save us and therefore Christianity must be true, and any reasonable person, if they just listen to the arguments of theologians, will embrace Christianity as the rational way to understand reality, because we can demonstrate it, you know, more or less, like you might say, scientifically, or from obvious premises or evident premises to, to sound conclusions. That is not what he's doing. Okay, so Aquinas is beginning from a standpoint of faith, and he believes that certain things can be known by natural reason, for example, we might study the cause, this is his example, the cause of lunar eclipses, and we might be able to explain them scientifically. He actually knows the right scientific explanation for them in the Middle Ages. Uh, but when we come to know it, come to, uh, to the analysis of mysteries of the faith, we don't begin from evident premises of natural reason or something like, you know, mathematics, scientific observations, even philosophical truths about good and evil ethical behaviors or uh, whether a human being has a spiritual soul or these kinds of things that could be argued about philosophically. We begin from first principles that we can know only by the grace of faith. And so basically Aquinas thinks God can be known to exist by natural reason through argument from the existence of God. He thinks there are good arguments for the existence of God from philosophical premises to sound conclusions, but he thinks that knowing God in himself in his own mystery is a higher gift complementary to, not opposed to, natural reason or natural argument for the existence of God. This higher knowledge of God is the gift of grace, and the faith that is a, a gift 
affords us a new judgment. So you and I make judgments all the time. We make, make simple judgments like that the door is before us or that it, we're on aisle five of the grocery store and that the, the milk is on the other end of the aisle or something very simple, or we might judge more complicated, make a more complicated judgment that's natural. Like, I think this person really treats me as their friend, believes that I'm their friend, I'm their friend, I'm the friend of this other person. Okay, we make natural judgments like that, which are more estimative, but important. This is a judgment that's supernatural above, the, above nature, as it were. That's to say, we can judge by the grace of faith that Christ is alive in the resurrection, that he's real, and that he is both God and human. It's a gift of faith received by grace. Okay. That being said, it's not as if, as if we just receive the, the grace of faith and then are, as it were, blind to believe whatever other people tell us. There's an interior intelligibility or an intrinsic intelligibility to the mystery that God became human. And that's what we're beginning to study. What is, as it were, the logic, the wisdom, the interior structure, the, the mystery? Just like you can study in philosophy, what is a human being? You can study in theology, what is the being of Christ? They're not the same kind of study, but they have similitudes. Now, the next thing I just want to say before I actually talk about the article is that he uses the word necessity and salvation. Was the incarnation necessary for human salvation? Well, I'm going to actually look at these two words as we study the article. But what he's doing is, in fact, trying to explore what it even means to call something that God does necessary and what it means to talk about salvation. So it's not like these terms are front-loaded with meaning so that we already know everything they mean before we ask the question. Actually, it works the other way in Aquinas to study. He's provoking thought on what we mean by those terms. Is it necessary for God to become human for our salvation? What do you mean by necessary? Is it necessary for God to do anything, like create the world? If he creates the world, does he have to redeem the world if we fall into sin? What is salvation from sin anyway? Or what is sin for that matter? You know, so there's a, there's a kind of a exploration of what these questions mean. Now, with no further ado, let me then analyze this important article of the Summa Theologiae. He says at the beginning, I, I answer that. A thing is said to be necessary for a certain end in two different ways. First, when the end cannot be attained without it, as when food's necessary to preserve human life. So now we have what you might call the strong sense of practical necessity of a means to an end. Unless we have food to eat, we will starve to death. And in that sense, food is vital and of essential necessity as a practical means to stay alive. Then he says, Secondly, when the end is attained better and more conveniently, in Latin, the word convenience can mean also more beautifully, more fluidly, more fittingly, as a horse is necessary for a journey, right? So you're walking from Paris to Rome, which would, is something that Aquinas had did many times. And the Dominicans in his own era, by a sign of poverty, unlike the regular clergy at the time, did not ride horses, but walk. You see, so the, the, the example is, is poignant because the Dominicans walked everywhere. And so he says, well, it's necessary to have a horse for a journey to make clear that just as Dominicans don't actually, they kind of might feel like they need horses for the journey. They don't technically need them. It can be done far more fittingly, eloquently, beautifully, and um, conveniently if we have a horse to go from Paris to Rome, but we can walk. That means that in, in this less strong sense, it's fitting and maybe even highly congruent that God should become human to save us, but not essential. And then he says that in the first way, it was not necessary uh, for the restoration of human nature. For God in his omnipotent power could have restored the human, our human nature in many other ways. But in the second way, it was necessary that he should become incarnate for the restoration of human nature. Now, you know, Okay, so far so good. He's saying that God is omnipotent. He can do things in other ways, but he doesn't do things arbitrarily. He does things wisely and, and with a fitting goodness. So there's something beautiful, something good, something uh, uh, decorous, and you might say uh, with wisdom, something kind of logical, if not, if not occasioned by logic necessity, in the way God's done things. But what is this thing about restoration of the human race, restoration of human nature? Well, this obviously presupposes something's wrong that God wants to fix. 
And you could say, well, is it going to be the old moral claim that what's wrong with us is that we are sinners, that we've done things wrong, that we're morally frail, that we are ethically imperfect, that we've sinned against God, that we you know, need forgiveness? Well, yes, actually, but not first. Yeah, that will come up, but that's actually, you might say, metaphorically on the back burner. Restoration of human nature for Aquinas in this context means, first and foremost, uh, the restoration of friendship with God, to put the human race back on the path of orientation towards its true homeland and end, which is divinization or union with God. Uh, you might say we are disoriented. We don't know why we are, where we came from, why we should live, where we're me meant to go. And the incarnation is a great flare sent up to bring us a point of orientation on the horizon to send us back home toward where we're meant to be or go. That's to say, toward life in God. And also, we are wounded by sin. We are frail. We do have weaknesses. We have made mistakes. And so the incarnation is sent, as we'll see, not only to teach us that, but also to help us extricate ourselves from it, to get out of the, the, the problems. So then he says, basically, these two things. The incarnation took place for two reasons, for our furtherance in the good and for our, as, as a fitting way of healing us from our misery or suffering. He doesn't say, first and foremost, uh, healing us or, from our sin. He takes a more general approach. It's, you might say, almost more medical there's a lot of medical analogies of healing in Aquinas. So healing is the second general reason. The first general reason is elevation, to go up into God, uh, furtherance in the good. The second reason is to heal us and to bring us integrity, integral union of person, healing. Okay, so now he's going to talk about each of these tables, you might say, furtherance in the good and uh, uh, removal of, of miseries or evils, uh, the remedies to suffering. Each of these themes, I should mention, historically has an important has an important precedent in earlier great teachers of Christian theology, and he's purposefully appealing to them. So, on the one side, this idea of divinization, of furtherance in the good, to be united with God in grace, to be friends with God, and to be united with God by grace. This is a theme that we see originally uh, strongly emphasized by Athanasius in the fourth century and by Augustine in the fourth and fifth centuries in the East and in the West, in Greek and in Latin or ancient theology. And he's gonna appeal especially to Augustine. Uh, and then on the other side, the theme of Christ becoming human to extricate us from suffering, evil and sin is from Anselm, the, uh, from just the sort of the early scholastic period just before Aquinas. And Anselm is, uh, has written this uh, theory up in a famous book called Cur Deus Homo in Latin, Why Did God Become Human? And we'll come to him eventually, or to Aquinas' version of his theories. So we start then with furtherance in the good. How is it that we're divinized by God becoming human? And Aquinas here takes five reasons. I'm going to go through each of them briefly, um, but they're all united by a kind of common link. And the first three have to do with the so-called three theological virtues. These are virtues that we have not by nature, but by grace. Virtues that we can acquire only because God first acts in us by grace. And they are named by St. Paul in the, in the New Testament, the virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And so Aquinas begins with those, that basically God became human so that we could uh, grow in faith, hope, and charity. And as we'll see in a minute, they, this leads to divinization. Faith is faith unto union with God. Hope is hope unto union with God. And charity is charity, our love of God, unto final union with God and beatitude, our eternal happiness. So he says, first, first, with regards to faith, it's made more certain by believing God himself who speaks, or as Augustine says, in order that man might journey more trustworthily towards the truth, the truth itself, having assumed human nature, established and founded faith. Now, I said to you before that faith is a grace given into the intellect to allow us to make new judgments that we can't make by our own nature so that we know with certitudes truth that God has revealed, such as the fact that he has chosen the ancient Hebrew people, the Jews, through his covenant, that he's become human himself, that he's that Jesus in his human nature has been raised from the dead, and so forth. Why couldn't God give us the strength and grace of the strength of the grace of faith without becoming incarnate? Well, of course, Aquinas thinks he could. It's not strictly necessary that he do it this way, but it's more fitting because we are embodied human persons. That's to say, 
we have spiritual souls with intellect and free will that we live out in an embodied animal state. We are rational animals. You might say we're spiritual animals, persons who are corporeal. So for God to become human himself is the most fitting way for him, not necessary, but fitting way for God to speak to us, to make it certain who he is. You might say to manifest himself and to communicate the life of grace to us through his own human life, human conception, human growth in the womb, birth, eventual maturation as a human being, adolescence, adulthood, human life and career, suffering, torment, execution, and bodily resurrection. Through the whole course of his human life among us, God has manifested to us who he is, made himself in a certain sense humanly visible, spoken with human words, felt with human emotions, sensed with a human heart, and manifest his, in his human words, in his human intellect, in his human decisions, who he truly is. Right? So that's deeply fitting as a way to speak to our faith. The faith doesn't just terminate in the humanity of Jesus, in all the things I've just described. The faith terminates in the mystery of God in himself, the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the faith is deeply nourished, educated, aided by God's hominization, as the theologians say, God's being human. Right? So God being human, he, he comes to us in our state so that we might come to him in his state. He takes a strong step toward us so that we can know who he is and then return to him. Okay, so that's the idea that faith is a, is a sort of initiation of divinization or union with God, because it, Aquinas says elsewhere, it unites us to God or weds our intellect to God. It, he says in a way, faith is a certain kind of wedding, spiritual wedding of the soul with God. And it's allowed or it's, it's a, uh, invited because we can know who God is personally because he's revealed himself to us so perfectly. Now, secondly, with regards to hope, Aquinas says our hope is greatly strengthened by the incarnation because nothing was so necessary for raising our hope as to show us how deeply God loved us. What stronger proof could he afford us? All right, so hope is a, a virtue that desires and aims at eternal life with God, eternal union with God, supernatural hope, hopes in, for union with God through the means God has given us. Okay, so, you know, I think, you know, despite my frailties or my, my limitations or my ignorance or my simple incapacities, the, the confusingness of life, I can be united with God because God has resolved a lot of my problems and questions by revealing himself to me by becoming human. Yeah, I can't figure it all out for myself, left to myself. I might be very confused about the sense of the, of the world. Maybe I'd make, uh, be, maybe if I were a great philosopher, I'd come to a few important conclusions. But as for sorting out all the religious traditions, all the claims about the absolute, it could be very difficult and very murky. And I would be paralyzed because I would be humble enough not to think I knew the answer to everything. But God has taken the step toward us to illuminate us by faith so we can really know who he is through this great means of the incarnation. And he suffered and died for us in, in, in his human state. So the conversation about whether we can know God and, and whether we can believe that God really loves us and cares about us or whether the universe is impersonal and just happened to uh, produce us through a, a bunch of random chance mutations, that conversation on the level of faith is resolved. Um, we can argue about philosophically whether everything results from the gene pool accidentally or whether we're just pure uh, chance haphazard beings of matter. And we would want to give as Christians, good philosophical arguments against those uh, reduction reductivist views, but uh, we can calmly pursue those philosophical arguments with hope that that can't be true because also on another level on a higher register that doesn't destroy reason that encourages reason. We know by hope that God loves us and that God is personally interested in us. And sort of the conversation about whether he can forgive our sins is over because he's been crucified for us. So, you know, the idea that I'm so special, my sins are so great, God can't forgive me. You know, sometimes you hear people saying things like that. Well, that conversation is sort of resolved because God has told us that he has died for us, which means we can all have the humility of hoping in the forgiveness of sins and in un union with God. I mean, if he bothers becoming human and being crucified for us, then he can bother to divinize us. He has the power to do it. Okay, thirdly, with regards to charity, Love is greatly enkindled in us, as Augustine says. What greater cause is there for, of the Lord's coming 
and to show God's love for us. This is about presence. Uh, you know, if you love someone who's a friend and you're never really ever around that person, uh, even though you have the voluntary choice to be, then there's something odd about the way you love them. Right? Friendship is nourished through the real presence of the friend to the other person because of the way we are embodied personal creatures, embodied rational animals. We are present to others. God has become present to us in our embodied state to manifest the intensity of divine love in and through the incarnation. And he invites us to remain with him through his enduring presence in the world. This is, as you may imagine, some of you who are Catholic would imagine immediately that this was to be connected to the Eucharist. And indeed, when Aquinas argues why God has perpetuated the real presence of Christ in his body and blood among us in the mystery of the Eucharist, this is one of the key arguments he gives, that God remains with the church, albeit in a different way, uh, under the sacramental signs, but truly, really present substantially in the Eucharist so that we can nur nurture charity and love. The fourth reason is that God gives us an example of how to be human. So becoming himself the one who is most human of all, God teaches us how to be human and to recognize our own dignity as human beings, the greatness of our vocation of being human as something not to despair in or be just perplexed or paralyzed by, but to be, uh, you might say, encouraged by as a way that, we, that our human vocation is a vocation that can be lived out in view of life with God and with one another in view of life with God, so that we're afforded a, a great sense of dignity uh, in the example of Christ. And finally, he just says, as it were, the summary of all these points, with regards to the full participation of the divinity, that's why God became human, so that we might participate fully in the divinity, which is the true bliss of man, happiness, and the, and the end of human life, and which is bestowed on us by Christ's humanity. God was made man, that man might be made God. Now, he doesn't think we actually literally become the deity, okay? He doesn't think that heaven is that we get, you know, as it were, melded into God, into some kind of pantheistic um, blur, where we become God, the deity itself. The divinization is a participation, meaning a partaking without identification. And the participation occurs primarily through our intellect and will, through which we enjoy God through knowledge and love. And then this, in the beatific vision, can eventually redound to the corporeal body in the life of the resurrection. I'm not going to go into all that. But the point is, it's by knowledge and by love that human beings acquire their greatest happiness. If you think about it, I mean, being healthy bodily is very important for human happiness and being sufficiently nourished and taken care of on a very fundamental level, you know, in terms of like, you know, the, the hierarchy of needs. But deep happiness is the happiness of the mind and heart. It's happiness of resting in the truth as ultimate perspective. It's happiness of enjoying the pursuit of truth in life of uh, contemplation and pursuit of knowledge with others. It's the, the, it's the truth of meaningful human work. And it's the happiness of friendship, of family life, of uh, the happiness of being loved and loving, especially the happiness of loving God and being loved by God. Right? So that culminates for Aquinas in the happiness of seeing God in the beatific vision. The grace of heaven is the grace of eventually seeing God face to face and of loving God. They say, well, why does God becoming human lead to us becoming united with God by knowledge and by love in this life by faith, hope, and love, and in the world to come uh, through um, the vision of God? Well, in, because God has begun, to, begun in the incarnation to reveal himself to us in view of the perfecting of that knowledge. So he's begun to tell us who he is in the incarnation in view of the illumination, through the illumination of faith, knowing God in Christ. So we can begin to know God in this life already, the Holy Trinity, in view of a perfection of that in the world to come. And that we can begin to love God, who's manifested himself to us, and hope in God in view of divine union in the world to come. So faith, hope, and love, those first three things I spent some time talking about, they're aimed, you might say they're inclined teleologically, they're oriented toward uh, uh, you know, union with God in the beatific vision. Uh, and as we'll see in a moment, also God became human to remove the obstacles. So now I turn to the second table. Um, you know, what, what was God doing in, in withdrawing us from evil or with our remedying our mis misery, you might say, medically taking care of us? 
he says the first thing he says he talks about the devil he's uh that's that's the topic that may not always be mentioned by modern people though as we know pope francis mentions the devil often like uh the new testament and like many ancient philosophers even aquinas believes that there are uh, in, immaterial beings, angels, and there are not all the angels are good. There's also evil, and so there there is. It's not it's not a god, but there are immaterial forces of evil that can sow seeds of chaos and confusion in the human world. And because, in a sense, angels are superior to human beings, you have a history of human beings in religious behavior in their religious traditions, uh, either trying to placate angels or worship angels or practicing magic, uh, doing something other than orienting themselves towards God and getting confused about how to uh, relate to the angels. And what Aquinas says first about evil is interestingly like, Aquinas, God developed through the incarnation, God has established a direct relationship with us. You might say he bypasses any idea that we need to go through him, through the angels, so that we understand we can er immediately relate to God. And, and therefore, we don't have to be subjects to the angels through strange rituals or placations that could, in fact, lead us into dark corners by uh, all kinds of magic or bargaining or a superstitious ritual. Now, you may say, well, that, has that got much to do with anything in our day and age? Well, actually, in some ways, this first idea created our day and age because we live in a world where we think the human being is, in a certain sense, the highest intellectual reality. But the reason we take ourselves so seriously as a very high intellectual reality is in part because the angels got pushed out. The reason they got pushed out in part was because of our, the seriousness with which, with which Western Catholicism took the incarnation. It, you might say it this way. If God became human, then human beings are very important. And in the history of ideas, the sense that the human being is at the center of the cosmos is strongly uh, aided by the emphasis on the incarnation of because God didn't become an angel, became a human being. So you might say angel relativism took place in part because of Christianity. And if, if you look at ancient cultures, even ancient philosophical cultures like the Platonism of the third and fourth centuries prior to the time of Christ, but certainly also other religious traditions that exist today, this place of immaterial spirits can be very significant. It's also true, of course, in tribal cultures. And you can look at that in different continents. If you look, if you're a sociologist of religion, and you look at anything from like Navajo rights and uh, as they were studied in the 19th and early 20th century to uh, uh, ancient Near Eastern religions in the Middle East, or if you look at Hawaiian religion, I mean, there, it's, a, it's very complicated and there are many diverse trends. But one thing that, that you see is that pantheons of spiritual agents uh, are a common feature of many ancient cu cultures, whether tribal or more developed, you know, sort of uh, technologically more developed. And Christianity has a way of both maintaining the idea that there are, there is a kind of hierarchy of spirits, but without the absolutization of them, because they're subject to a higher principle, which is God, and human beings have a direct connection to God. So you might call this first reason kind of almost like cosmic therapy, you know, receiving a kind of therapy of our way of seeing ourselves in the cosmos because of the incarnation not taking ourselves as too insignificant. Secondly, because uh, we are taught thereby a great deal about man's dignity and how we should not sully it with sin. All right, so like belief that we can actually be transformed. Uh, the other, another church, you know, classic patristic author, Origen, has a famous homily where he says, believe that you can be transformed. And that's sort of the second idea is that if God bothered to become human, even despite our own sort of finitude, mortality, you know, sort of the seeming tininess in the cosmos. There's actually something about us that's of remarkable dignity, and we need to cherish and value that and not give in to despair. And despair can be very related, cosmic despair, you might say, can be very related to sin, to resignation in the face of our evil inclinations, our weaknesses. Uh, so basically to fight, to be a more dignified person is related to the belief in our own spiritual dignity in the face of the incarnation. Thirdly, because in order to do away with man's presumption, the grace of God is commended in Jesus Christ, uh, though no merits of ours went before. So the third reason is humility. God has saved us by taking the first initiative, yes, but if God, who so transcends us as our creator and is so vast and infinite, has condescended to become human, if God has, you might say, 
taken this, this route of lowliness, of humbling himself by taking on the form of a human nature, then how much more are we capable of becoming humble in, in the face of God, in the face of Christ, in the face of one another? And humility, as Aquinas notes, is, very, is one of the most beautiful things in a human being. So the acquisition of humility is deeply related to beauty. We, you know, we think about moral righteousness often in very, um, uh, well, I don't know, I mean, I want to say moralistic tones. I mean, tones of adjudication of, of good and evil, but also beauty, beauty is a very important part of good and evil. To become a beautiful soul, it, to become a, a soul that's not ugly. And the virtues make the soul beautiful, and humility is beautiful, and pride is ugly. And so working against spiritual ignobility and ugliness and working towards spiritual um, lowliness of heart and humility is, is part of, is related to taking the incarnation seriously. God is himself the first who, in condescension to us, became lowly and exhibited the humility. Jesus' human humility is an ex exhibition of the intensity of the charity of God which invites us to humility. This is also related to uh, the fourth reason where he says, you know, he curbs man's pride because we're not really, we're not the saviors of the world. Now the medievals might think about this in a, in a different way than us, but, you know, we have to think about being our own saviors in a slightly different and I'd say even more intensive way because we're so convinced as modern human beings that it's all on us. We're going to have to create the perfect political society, the most technologically advanced society, the most efficient society, the best organized kind of social policy uh, policies need to be put in place. And of course, these efforts are reasonable, but the point is we're still bound by mortality. We're still bound by ethical fragilities, uh, you know, really terrible moral weaknesses and compromises. And we're not going to repristinate ourselves through our collective efforts. We're not going to save and divinize ourselves through technology. We're not going to download our brains onto hard drives and uh, figure out some way to preserve our personalities like it, you see in these fantastic TV movies, we're going to die and we're going to be judged and we're relative, we're not first in the world. And so the incarnation helps us acknowledge that, you might say, after the fact of God already resolving the problem for us. It's like God catches you and he says, okay, now admit you're falling. You know, like, I admit it, <laughs> it's easier when you've been caught, right? So the incarnation is, is God sort of saying, okay, I got you, but now you know you have a problem you gotta work on, okay? And he, I'm gonna help you work on it. Fifthly, in order to free man from the enslavement of sin, and now he talks about the idea that God became human in order to make us just. And Aquinas develops Anselm's great theory here. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to describe it to you briefly. And it's, the theory is this. The human being in grace originally is meant to be in friendship with God. Had we never lost grace, we would live in friendship with God. And to live in friendship with God is to be in a certain proportionate righteousness with God, a kind of rightness of integrity of order, a certain justice, where we, uh, justice really means order for Aquinas, a right order where we give God what is his due, acknowledge him in the way we ought to. And also God communicates to us as our creator and as our redeemer, as the one who gives us grace, he communicates to us what is our due. Um, not in the sense that God owes us something, but in the sense that once he creates us, he, he maintains a just order and integrity of order in us. If we mess that up by sinning against God, then two things need to happen. One is we need to somehow re restore our own inner integrity and life with God. And secondly, we need to be reconciled with the justice of God. Now you might say, wait, 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 wait. Okay. I know where you're going with this. Uh, we need to be justified because we need someone to render us just before God. Okay. I got that. But why can't God just do it all through mercy? Why can't he just say, okay, human race has sinned, the human race has fallen into this disintegrity, disorder. I'm just going to zap them with grace, and I'm going to forgive them by pure mercy. Well, actually, Aquinas says he could have done that. But the, the best way to do it, the most fitting way, is not just to save us by mercy, but he says it's more merciful if he reconciles us also with the divine justice. The justice here is not like justice is judging you with severity to put you in hell. Justice here is God putting all things right in according to his ordering wisdom and in accord with his righteousness and his, his, his holiness and his goodness. So if we've defamed the goodness and holiness of God, if we've become unjust and the human race, there's a lot of injustice, not only in our, all our individual lives, we've done things that are unjust to other people and no doubt before God, 
but also there are just catastrophes of injustice in the human race where we, we have just done really terrible things and continue to do terrible things. So in the face of our systemic injustice, whether it's personal or collective, God gives us, you might say, a twofold justice. The first justice is that of Christ as man, because being full of grace, Jesus is sinless, loving, and obedient, and perfectly humble and just. So where we have been unrighteous, God has become humanly righteous for us. You could say he's restored us to integrity. Jesus is the one who's just, the humanly just, the humanly righteous one. And he shares his grace with us. We participate in Christ's grace by faith, hope, and love. And we can be healed, inwardly healed, and transformed by the grace of Christ so that we begin to assimilate and, well, you might say be assimilated to Christ's own righteousness. All right. So God becomes a human being who's perfectly righteous and by grace and then communicates that grace of righteousness to us the righteousness of Christ, to be justified, to be rendered gracious, gracious, just, and righteous in Christ's grace. Okay, he does it by mercy. But the other thing he does is he communicates to us, the human race, in Christ, his infinite justice as God. Why? Because Christ is God. He's not just human. He's also God. So what he does as human, as one who's human among us, he also does in such a way that there's an infinite dignity of justice to his actions. If Christ is crucified, he's crucified in his human nature through that moral righteousness I spoke about before. He's a, he's a witness to the truth. He's a witness to justice and love. He dies for the good and not because of ill. And he humbly offers his life for us. And that's all human righteousness by which he justifies us by the graces of his, by, the, by grace and by merit. But he also does so as one who's Lord, who's infinitely just, and so there's an infinite righteousness to the cross, not just, not just the finite righteousness of Christ or the, the sort of immeasurable righteousness of his human grace and his human heart. There's the infinite righteousness of Christ's deity, of the God uh, man who is crucified. And so he unites us uh, through his grace, not only with himself as man or with the righteousness of his, you know, the righteousness of Christ as man, but with the, with the infinite justice of God as given to us as a gift. Now you say, well, why doesn't it change me more? <laughs> yeah, why am I changed by faith, hope, and charity? Well, the answer is he, we are changed. We are changed as we cooperate with faith, hope, and love progressively and, and uh, according to the, the measure God wills. And also God wisely leaves in us weaknesses so that we realize our dependence in Christ and we grow through free cooperation. We have to cooperate freely with the grace. We have to pray for the grace we have to use the sacraments as they're intended to be used by going to confession and, and, you know, participating in Christ's mystery of the church in the ways he intends for us. And we can be changed. We can live lives where we are gradually improved. But we also remain frail so that we learn to turn not to ourselves as the source of our remedies, but to Christ, who gives us the infinite justice of the, of the Godhead and the finite, you might say, justice of his human nature as gifts all by mercy, so that we can live in friendship with God. Now, that doesn't mean that Aquinas thinks we can't lose all this, or that we have to accept that, you know, we don't need to embrace Christianity, we don't need to embrace the mystery of salvation, we can also uh, live it badly, we can forfeit it, like the mystery of human real, free will is real. And he says later in the Summa that after baptism, it's very significant that we still die. He asks, why do, why, if God has done all this for us, why do we still die after baptism? And he has different reasons there, but one reason he's, you know, from Augustine, he says, well, if we, if we were, if we were baptized and then we became immortal because we were baptized, everyone would get baptized in order to be immortal, but that wouldn't change anything about love for God, right? So you can't have people achieve the, the redemption has to be a redemption of the human heart as well as human and the human mind as well as human body. So it's not like God's just going to give you uh, a return to Eden. You move forward from the first tree of Eden to the second tree of the cross, and the redemption takes place at the second tree, which is a continuation of the mystery. It's not a rewriting of history or blotting out of it. It's a continuation of fulfillment of history. And so, you know, after Christ is crucified and his bodily um, undergoes bodily glorification of his body and soul, he opens a way for us through his redemption to be united with God. And I said already through faith, hope, and love and through imitation of Christ in this life in view of union with God the next. But it does take place in and through the 
uh, ongoing mortality that we experience because of our bodily weaknesses and our emotional fragilities, and even more, you know, seriously in a certain way, the evils that continue to um, affect the human race because of our personal sin, because of the collective sin of the human race, because of the sin of others. And so Christians, you might say, live now the mystery of the redemption of Christ on a battlefield. It's not a return to the, the order of Eden or some order that might have been had we never fallen into this drama, but rather through the thicket of drama, we walk after Christ in view of union with him by faith, hope, and love, imitating him in and through the mystery of death, in view of the mystery of eternal life and eventual resurrection. Right? So it, it requires faith. It requires hope. It isn't just, as it were, something seen. It also is, in a way, for us, meritorious to contemplate God in the darkness of faith and sometimes on the consolation or light of faith to walk towards the mystery that, you know, God has initiated through the incarnation of the crucifixion and resurrection. So, you know, what I'm, what I'm intimating here at the end is the, the why did God become human that opens up onto a lot of questions. Like, why does God become human and suffer? Why didn't he just fix everything at one go? Uh, why didn't God become human more than once? Why didn't God become human in, in different continents? Uh, wh why is it all transmitted by one people and in one apostolic community, one church? Uh, why does he institute the, the sacraments so that they accompany us? How does this relate to our own bodily death? How does this relate to our hope in life after death for the soul and eventually the transfiguration of this material world and the resurrection of the dead? How are all these things connected, right? So you see how the question at the beginning can open up into a vast panorama. But I, I think I've probably fulfilled my duty in introducing the very idea I said I would, and I've spoken for far too long. So now I'll open the floor and take your questions. Great talk, Father. Um, our first question is from Massachusetts. Uh, Bob asks, and I'm going to read it out for Bob. If God is thought to be pure act, then how does the Son of God assume potentiality like human nature? Because it seems like a contradiction. Yeah. Okay, great question. So it's an old question. It's a good question, uh, which is asked even very early on, in, especially in the 5th century controversies between Nestorius and Cyril of Alexandria. How can God become human and not, as it were, um, delimit the perfection of his divine nature? You have different aspects to this problem, and I've written actually a lot about this in my book, The Incarnate Lord, that uh, Father Thomas mentioned at the beginning of the talk. And there's a good book by Thomas Wynandy. Well, he's got two, Does God Change and Does God Suffer, both on this topic. So I'll just refer to you to those as, if, you know, for like longer studies. Uh, but uh, the short answer is it's very important when God, that when we talk about the incarnation to always distinguish the two natures. So God becomes human, but God doesn't, the, the, the harmonization of the Son of God does not entail the fusion or confusion of the two natures. So the divine nature is not in any way delimited, according to at least traditional theology. He doesn't undergo any self-emptying or kenosis of his divine perfections. The divine perfection is uh, maintained. God remains, you say, as you said, pure act infinite in his power and goodness and so forth, but he acquires a finite human nature capable of suffering. And so he truly is human and he truly is God. And there's no confusion of the two natures. So that then you ask, well, how can they be united? Ha, it's a famous question. And the tr famous answer is given by Cyril of Alexandria initially. They're united hypostatically, let's say, in the one person of the Son of God. So the Son who's eternally uh, Lord and God, perfect in his divinity, now begins to exist from the first conception in the womb of the Virgin Mary and throughout his bodily human life and now in the resurrection. He continues to subsist as one who's human. The human the God's becoming human doesn't either subtract from or add to the perfection of his deity. He remains perfectly God, even as he becomes perfectly human. As God, he's unable uh, to you might say, evolve or become less perfect or undergo suffering. And in his human nature, he develops. He lives in time in, among us. He can undergo development and um, also suffering. He's got the bodily potentiality and spiritual potentiality of, those, of the spiritual faculties of his soul. And he has an ordinary human history like us. 
Now, the reason God can be among us without, in a way, as it were, delimiting himself is because God, as the creator, is he who is, he who gives being to all things. He's not the creation, but he's more interior to all creatures than they are to themselves because he's the cause of their very being. Right? So God is present to everything that is, including right now, all that we are, everything you can see, your own body and soul, all that is. God is more interior to us than we are to ourselves simply because he's giving it all to exist, to be. He's giving existence to everything. So he can become present in a new way through the incarnation by being human without in any way going, you might say, outside of himself or having to travel through the world or something like that because he's already omnipresent. But this is a new form of presence in which the Son of God, the eternal word, becomes hypostatically present, say personally present, in joining a human nature to himself Without, dimin without in any way being diminished in his deity, but now existing as one who's truly human. That's mysterious, but it's not contradictory. Okay, um, our next question is from Rome. And Juliana asks, uh, could you please talk a bit about the central centrality of the passion in the mystery of salvation? When we pray the creed, we lower our heads when the incarnation is mentioned, but not the passion. The cross is the symbol of the church, and it is said that Christ crucified is where we see the perfection of all virtue. Why is that? Is it because it shows the depths of our brokenness and that we would crucify the Lord? Is it because through suffering, Jesus shows a love for God and us that is most completely disinterested? Yeah, okay, so... Let me say just two things briefly. This is an immense question. I mean, so first thing to say is not only theologians, but whole liturgical traditions within the church can emphasize different mysteries of Christ in a more special way. So God's becoming human in the incarnation is one fundamental mystery of salvation. God's crucifixion or God being crucified in his human nature is another. And then the bodily resurrection of Christ, who is now alive in the resurrection, inaugurating the recreation of the world and reigning in a hidden way in his kingdom, is another mystery. And, you know, for example, in the Orthodox Church, it's a famous point about the liturgy that on those years when the Annunciation, which is the beginning of the incarnation, when the Virgin Mary receives the announcing of the of the incarnation from the archangel gabriel when the when the annunciation falls on the same day as good friday in the orthodox church they they celebrate the liturgy of the annunciation right so that that emphasizes more the aspect of the incarnation than than you might say good friday or crucifixion that would never happen in the latin church because of the emphasis on crucifixion in the latin church then you have the second my point isn't that one of those is right or wrong it's just there are different points of accent accentuation and that's one of the salutary things about theology is to think about how, how to balance, as it were, the way these mysteries are connected to each other. The second thing I just want to say briefly is there are many reasons associated with, you might say, the logic of divine truth and love is manifest in multiple ways in each of these three mysteries, incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection. When you look at the, the crucifixion, I think probably most people would say, most theologians at least, would say the central reason that it is emphasized as the mystery of our salvation is because it manifests the love of God for us in the most intensive way, because he suffered for us. Others, though, would emphasize rightly, also another aspect you could emphasize, the Christ's human self-offering as the principle of merit, that Christ who's sinless and full of grace, he who's without sin, is obedient and loving there where we failed to be loving and obedient, there where we have been lacking in perfection and therefore christ has redeemed us or been the, the he's the source of he's atoned for our sins he's um made reparation for our sins and been the principle he's the principle of our of of the merit of our grace in that respect so you, you can elucidate different reasons another reason people that's classic is to say the crucifixion reveals the powers of evil in the world so it you might say it teaches us a lot about who we are uh before god and and our real uh, like it exposes the, the, the syndrome of evil in history, and it shows the, the, the power of, of divine goodness to, to uh, triumph even in the darkest night of evil, and so therefore shows the power of God to vanquish evil in the world. 
and gives us hope even in the face of every human tragedy and, and, and moral failure, because we see that everything can be used by God, even God's own human crucifixion, to bring about a greater good. You know, so the theodicy questions there about how God works in the world in the face of uh, our human um, confrontation with evil. So there's a lot you can say, right? But, and so, you know, I, 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 nothing, it's, it's always wrong to kind of pit these things against one another, but where you place the priorities is, is, is based on sort of different theological sensibilities. And, uh, and, and you can have theologians can argue more for one than another. Okay, thanks, Father. Our next question is from Jerusalem. Uh, Jude Mary wants to ask, um, God could, be, could God become man without being born of a woman? He is God and with him everything is possible. Why was it fitting then that he is born of a woman? Or is this a non-event, for example, the theology of the incarnation and having no salvific undertones? I don't understand the last part of the question, but I would say, I mean, you know, that's another, it's a good question as to what's going on in the divine, what we call the divine maternity, God having a human mother. Um, it's clearly important that God is, I mean, in the, in the Christian tradition, Jesus is fully human in a, you might say, in an ordinary way. He has a human body like ours, capable of suffering. He has a human emotional life like ours that undergoes psychological development in, or, in an ordinary developmental way, perhaps healthier than ours in some way, some ways. But I mean, fundamentally, the structure of his emotional appetites and passions is the same as ours. His human animal psychology, so to speak, it, the way it develops through stages of life. And he has a human intellect by which he learns from the world and a human will by which he makes ordinary moral choices and develops and has intentions and manifests, uh, you know, different moods and, and humors and, and intentions in his, um, in his apostolic ministry. And so Jesus is really human, really, really, really human. And uh, I mean, God could do anything. Uh, you know, there are, you know, the, 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 but Christianity is not a science fiction film. You know, you wouldn't get a tradition of a billions of people believing it if it were. Um, and it's true that people can believe a lot of crazy things. It's just fact, you know, and superstitions exist. But I mean, the sort of power of the Christian understanding is that God truly became one of us in all we are, including uh, undergoing the ordinary history of conception, fetal gestation, eventual maturation of the womb and human birth and the experience of being uh, nurtured uh, and growing and being educated by a human mother and an adoptive human father and having an ordinary human life among us, even learning a, a work trade and so forth. Okay, so um, the, the logic of all that, I think on a deep level is God does not interrupt the history of the cosmos. We're not gonna see cosmic events happen where God just as it were stops the film the way human beings would make, would might do in, an, in a surreal or imaginary portrait of reality on uh, in a science fiction film he's con he's committed to the nature the natural structure and order of the cosmos why is that well the real deep reason is he created it i mean it has god doesn't just care about us he cares about the whole creation and he created the cosmic order the world of um, microscopic vegetative and animal life that surrounds us and which is as it were the presupposition for our emergence he's committed to it and it's going to continue with a certain integrity. And so when he becomes human, he enters into that cosmic history. He doesn't obliterate it. Now we could also talk, of course, about the Virgin Mary, what her discipleship means, why Jesus doesn't have a human father. That's a miracle. Why does that matter? It images the fact that he has a transcendent fatherhood, uh, that there's an eternal mystery of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in God. And so, you know, there's other interesting things about the miracle of the virginal conception of Jesus. But um, the fundamental emphasis on the Marian component here is not something exceptional about Jesus, though there is the exceptional miracle of his origins, um, which is, it matters, but it's the more fundamental truth is he really became one of us and he had a human mother like us, you know, who was his best, who was the greatest disciple. Wow, thanks, Father. Um, our next question comes from Belgium, and Michael's going to ask you the question himself. Okay. Okay, uh, Father Thomas, good evening, um, and greetings from, uh, from Leuven in Belgium. Um, thanks for your interesting talk. Um, could you 
comments on the question whether God would have become man without the fall. Um, yeah. And the reason that I'm wondering it is that uh, if Christ is the bridegroom of the church um, and therefore also our bridegroom, uh, doesn't the Thomistic position seem to imply that he became our bridegroom in order to save us instead of saving us because he had already decided from the very beginning of the world to yeah. become our bridegroom? Um, okay. And wouldn't that imply sort of instrumentalization of the spousal love between, between God and mankind? Okay, it's a great question. So there's a famous article that comes right after this one that I didn't get to. Um, and it's, it's a famous dispute, which you could talk, you could not only give a, another talk on it, you could teach a whole class about it, or you could write books about it. And that's about whether the, it's a famous speculative question debated among medieval theologians. Would God have become human even had we never sinned? I mean, was that the point from the beginning? Did God create the cosmos and the world of creatures in order to create human beings in order eventually to become human? I mean, was that, you might say, is that the centerpiece of the cosmos for God to become human? And St. Albert the Great, who was Aquinas' teacher, thought something like that, who was a Dominican. And uh, Dun Scotus famously argues that this is the case, great Franciscan theologian. But Bonaventure, another great Franciscan theologian, holds the same position as Aquinas, which I'm about to elaborate. And then I'll just talk about it for a second. So when Aquinas asked the question, the first thing he says is, we don't know. We don't know if God would have become human had we never sinned, because we depend on revelation to know the intimate in, uh, intentions of God, the inner life of God. And we don't have in revelation an explicit and clear, uh, unambiguous revelation as to whether God would have become human, even had we never sinned. Uh, however, then he says, insofar as revelation reveals something to us. So, that, I mean, that first point is important because Aquinas is against the idea of hypothetical counterfactual theology, like trying to make up in theology truths about God or tr make up or speculate about truths about God that are outside the boundaries of what God's revealed to us. Because, you know, it's epistemic humility. You only kind of know the things God's revealed to you. Otherwise, you need to have uh, recourse to philosophy. We're not doing philosophy here. We're looking at what God's revealed, and there's a kind of asceticism to theology. Uh, we can wonder about it, but we can't necessarily answer it. And we need to be careful not to leap outside the boundaries of what we really have authority to say or can rightly say based on what God's revealed authoritatively. But then he says, as for the speculation, it does seem, as the creed says, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. That's to say, for our salvation, he became incarnate. So it seems God became incarnate in order to save us or redeem us. And that raises the question of whether um, the incarnation is just a means to an end. Well, in a certain sense, uh, I think Aquinas does think that God did not need to become incarnate except because we sin. And you say, well, w wait, does that mean he doesn't think the incarnation is ultimate? And I think the answer is, in a sense, yes, he does not think that is correct. He does not think the incarnation is ultimate. So what is the ultimate mystery for Aquinas? I think in his theology, it's pretty clear what it is. It's the Trinity. God is the Trinity, a mystery of the communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he created us from the beginning, angels and human beings, and the whole cosmos to share by grace a participation in the divine life of the contemplation of God, the Trinity. So his theology is utterly theocentric and Trinitarianocentric. And after we've fallen, after Adam and Eve or the first human couple fell, the first human civilization fell, and we fell into the world of sin and death, and you might say benightedness, spiritual disorientation, God became human to draw us back up into the original gift of union with the Trinity. The Trinity is the ultimate mystery. The Trinity has manifested itself to us in the incarnation. Now, you could still argue that, I mean, I think there's a lot of strength to that argument. I like it because it's theocentric. What I worry about with saying that the, the ultimate mystery is the incarnation is that it makes it, in a way, strangely, about us. Like, God created the world in order to become one of us. Um, well, he, he really created the world, I think, in a way, ultimately, so that we could enjoy God for God's own sake. Um, and God is really the center of creation. But the humanity of Jesus is the centerpiece of creation after the incarnation. And Cajetan, who's a Dominican responding to Scotus on this, has, I think, a lovely kind of way of taking it, which is to say, God created us for union with the Trinity. The universe is centered on the Trinity. But after the fall, God did something even greater than he had done in the first creation. 
and a way as a way to respond to sin with even greater mercy by doing something yet more potent, more profound than he had done initially. And he did that by becoming human. So the second greatest thing in the universe is the incarnation. And so he used, as it were, the occasion of sin to do something even yet greater. So I, I think you can move, take a step toward the SCOTUS position that way with Cajetan while still retaining Aquinas' emphasis on the fact that he became human for our salvation so that we could be united with God. But this is a massive question, and there's a lot of ink spilt, and theologians debate about it quite a lot. It's a, it's a beautiful debate and an important one. Wow. Thanks, Father. Uh, our next question is from Delaware. Uh, Elizabeth is going to ask you her question. Hi, Father. Um, this is Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth, you're very faint. It's very faint. I'm not hearing you quite oh, that well. Hi, can you hear me? This is good. Oh, okay, sorry. The connection's not that great here. Um, so, yeah, this is Elizabeth Yang from Delaware. It's good to see you. How are you doing? Um, I'm doing well. Yeah, hanging in there. So, yeah, it's, it's getting bitingly cold here. So, um, but uh, uh, it's good to be here. Um, I just wanted to ask probably two very, maybe very basic questions. But uh, the first one is, how do we perceive or understand secular human efforts to exercise or attain justice in light of Aquinas' notion of justice? So I'm wondering how we can relate those two um, and especially in light of what's going on right now in the world in terms of, you know, the reckoning with, um, you know, racial sort of our racial past in the United States and um, mm -hmm. the racial history and uh, all that. So, so that's my first question. And then the second is, could you elaborate or explicate the notion that Jesus defines humanity, humanity that he reveals what it means to be truly, quote unquote, human? Um, so, so those are my two questions. Thanks. Okay, let me do, those are both big questions. I'm going to deal with them briefly. I'm going to deal with the second one first. Sure. So the, the second one is about how is Jesus most human? I mean, in some sense, he's human just because he has the same human nature as us. But our human nature can take on different modes, let's say different ways of being. So we can be more sinful or less sinful. And another thing, I mean, we can be, you know, more, more virtuous, more morally perfect, less morally perfect, more vitiated, more, more uh, virtuous. And the second thing is we can be in a state of grace and or, or uh, more or less in a state of grace and more affected by the healing and elevating effects of grace, as we see in the great saints. OK, so a, a Christ's human nature is sinless, most virtuous and inundated with holiness and grace. And so he he embodies in a certain way what it is to be most human because he's uh, free from vice oriented towards virtue and, and radiant with holiness uh, in a way that's greater than that of any of the other saints, but is in a way you might say the exemplum, the exemplar or measure of holiness in other, uh, for all of the saints. So no saint is holier than Christ in his humanity, in his sacred humanity. So his way of being human is more perfect. It, he, he's equally human to us in, you might say, nature. He has the same human nature as us. We're all equally human, but he's... Um, more perfect in his way of being human. Now, with regards to justice, I mean, obviously, you know, we could spend a lot of time on that other subject, which is sort of Aquinas on justice and how we could relate it to our contemporary uh, cultural arguments about justice and transgressions of justice with regards to, for example, let's just take race, which is what you mentioned. Um, Aquinas has a whole, you might say, secular theory of justice based on philosophy that's perfectly compatible with co the contemporary problematic. I mean, uh, Aquinas has a really robust understanding of justice developed out of Aristotle, but which he develops in his own original ways, which has to do with fundamentally the acknowledgement of what is due to each one in a rational way, both in regards to personal relations and with regards to political relations. And this can be acknowledged in various ways that he calls social, distributive, and commutative. I won't go through all of them, but basically, the one we're looking at is uh, that you're alluding to fundamentally is commutative justice to recognize the dignity that is proper to each one that is that accrues to them in virtue of their being human. OK, so then there's other things about how each person can participate in the common good that's social justice and how each person can receive from the common good. What is their due based on their own needs or limitations? That's distributive justice. So it's a very powerful tool, his idea of justice for how you can recognize each one's equal right to participate 
each one's need, uh, each each one's equality before the law, each one's need to participate in the common good of society, and each one's uh, need to receive a proportionate aid. Okay, and then you can look at things like uh, racial injustice historically and say that part of the issue is the fundamental acknowledgement of human dignity. Now, you know, it may sound like this is too easy a thing to say, but part of the fact of the matter is historically, one of the ways that Europeans reached the idea of radical racial equality across the world was through Aquinas' teaching. And it had to do with uh, the theologians from Salamanca when the Portuguese and Spanish arrived in the new world and they, they, they encountered uh, indigenous societies that were non-literate and you had um, pop, you know, Europeans arrive and immediately try to enslave them or make them subservient. And you had Franciscan and Dominican theologians who wrote back to the, the um, Salamanca school and asked for literary treatises that would help them argue for the dignity of the, of the native populations. And it's pretty, it's, it's pretty established that this is one of the major sources of modern human rights theory based on Aquinas' theories of human dignity based on our common nature and the justice, principles of justice that accrue to it. Okay, then you could get into questions that are more subtle, prudential questions about reparations or about social egalitarianism and whether distributive justice needs to see in certain cases whether people, you know, should receive, I don't know, you know, if you've had an oppressed citizen class, should there be scholarships to universities that reach out to those people in an assiduous way to try to, you know, create greater educational equality, social upward mobility. And, you know, we could go into other cases, but, you know, the point is you have to have a fundamental theory of human dignity and, and see how social justice, uh, distributive justice and community of justice accrue to people because of that ontological dignity. And then you can begin to analyze what's wrong um, with you know, patterns of injustice coherently. I think part of the problem we lack today is a, is a sufficient deep shared theory of justice. Uh, and of course that would take us into other realms about other, other available theories and their, their, their strengths and shortcomings. Thank you so much. Father, well, we have three more questions. Um, there's one from uh, Wuhan in China. Uh, All right, why don't we take one more question and then we'll, we'll liberate our participants. We'll take this as the last question. <laughs> okay, Ten, go ahead. Oh, hello, uh, Father Thomas. We met in Wuhan. Can you remember me? In <laughs> yes, it's great to hear from you. It's, it's, it's happy to meet you here. I, I have, uh, actually, I'm now in Bonn in Germany. And I, I will ask a very basic uh, question regarding the uh, di difference between Plotinus uh, in nation's teaching and, and incarnation. Maybe a very basic question. I want to hear about uh, your opinion or comments on the essential difference. Between, did you say Plotinus? Yeah, uh, emanation, emanation's teaching. Emanation, yeah, yeah. Uh, and in incarnation. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The, the, I mean, the, the famous discussion of this is in Augustine, because Augustine was a Platonist, very influenced by Plotinus, highly influenced by Plotinus. And his conversion from Platonism to Christianity was occasioned in part by his acceptance of the incarnation as a more perfect way of, you might say, embracing the philosophical life. I mean, as you know, in the ancient world, philosophers often when they talked about philosophy in the ancient Greco-Roman world, it was, it meant the, it meant what the word says in Greek, philosophia, friend, friendship with wisdom, which means it wasn't just an attempt to explain reality, but also a way of life, a kind of, you might say almost like a, an intellectual religious vocation of the Greek and Roman philosophers. And Aquin, Augustine was on the search for that, uh, you might say ultimate way of life and truth uh, that led him into the Manichaeans and he, he was dissatisfied with them and he, re he read the Neoplatonists, uh, but he felt like there was something lacking in the Neoplatonists and it was actually reading Athanasius, uh, Athanasius's life of Anthony about the holiness of St. Anthony in Egypt when he began to believe that something more perfect can be lived in this world as a way of wisdom, as a way of, of philosophical life. And that's what led to the converge, famous conversion scene in the garden. They're reading that book when he runs out into the garden in the Confessions. But what he says is, it's interesting, the, Neo the Platonists, like Plotinus, believe in the emanation of the word, the eternal word, the logos, the reason of God that's behind the order of the world. But what they don't believe is that God would fittingly humble himself to become uh, a human being and take on human flesh because they believe matter is such a lowly principle that it's incompatible with the dignity of the divine. 
right? So if God is really divine and it's intellectual, and if there's the emanation of logos or wisdom, a word, you know, reason, the emanation of eternal reason from the one, then it's unfitting or impossible that God should rightly become human because the flesh is so lowly a principle that he who's immutably perfect couldn't take on such an imperfect state. Now, you know, Augustine says there's a more perfect expression of God's humility and love and goodness in becoming human than the Neoplatonists understood. And he says they lack the humility to accept that God became human and so forth. Okay, Aquinas in this question I've been talking about, the art, the first article is actually about that. It basically says, is it totally unfitting for God to become human such that it'd be actually impossible? Like just God is so perfect, he can never take on the imperfection of matter. And he says there that uh, God can, God fittingly, uh, his argument is based on divine goodness. He says, God is infinitely good. Now it's proper to what's good to fittingly communicate itself to another. That's a very strong claim. He takes from a Neoplatonist Dionysius, the Areopagite. That the idea that if you're that good, the good is diffusive of itself, right? So a person who's morally good does good for others. Uh, but, you know, um, there's a way, like, for example, the goodness of human fecundity is to transmit life, you know, through having children. I mean, there's lots of examples you can give of this kind of principle and, and, and see if you can make it work, you know, apply it, you know, talk about different kinds of goodness in the world and how there communic there's communication of being. You might say if a person's a good teacher. No, no claims about myself. If a person's a good teacher, they can, they can really diffuse knowledge. They're good at teaching, okay? Right, so that's the idea, the diffusiveness of the good. Okay, he says, God doesn't have to become incarnate, but if he is infinitely good, it's fitting that he should diffuse his goodness in the most maximal way possible. And because it's good of him to create us as rational animals in material bodies, it's also good of him to become incarnate and manifest himself in the flesh for God to take on human physical existence to manifest his goodness. All right, so Aquinas doesn't do it quite as polemically as Augustine. But he does make this argument that the, what the Neoplatonists, they saw that God was, there was this emanation of wisdom in God or emanation of reason, but they didn't see the, the, the divine goodness and the way God could manifest the goodness he, that he has, the infinite goodness he has, especially by communicating himself most perfectly to the creature by becoming human. And so that's an interesting theological polemic against a philosophical position. And that's another interesting part of the whole study of this uh, subject. So I'd like to thank everybody for being present tonight. I'd like to thank those of you who persevered for your great patience. Uh, this talk, like others that are online with us live streaming, will eventually be up on YouTube and it can be shared. We'd like to um, thank you for your presence tonight and encourage you to join our um, Facebook page and also you know, uh, put your email address in on our website at the Angelicum Thomistic Institute website if you'd like to receive regular updates and of course sign up for our, our future events. Thank you. It's great to be with you and have a good night.